made you jump, didn't I? <laughs> no? Well, at least I tried. All right, let's get this lighting set up. Um... Let's do this. Hot take, I do not like the Five Nights at Freddy's books. Dumb, dumb, dumb. My feelings with the FNAF franchise are complicated. When I was first introduced to the series, there was something there that just clicked. Seeing the Let's Plays and going, this was something different. There's a lot you can say about the repetitive gameplay, the inside baseball logic you need to understand the lore, FNAF World, just FNAF World. But there is a reason this series continues to stay in the popular consciousness, at least on the internet, over other let's play jump scare horror games of the month. When's the last time you thought of Slender? Got him. The fact that Scott Cawthon's series of killer-possessed robots continues to have a cultural impact is not something you can chalk up to as a passing fad. But that doesn't mean everything that comes out comes with praise. Which brings us to the books. They're not good. Silver Eyes is an overstuffed, snail paced mess of a story, while the Twisted Ones did better, but fell apart with a confusing ending that left me exhausted. I go into detail in their respective videos, uh, links in the description. Which brings us here. The Fourth Closet, the pulse-pounding conclusion to the best-selling trilogy. Will it answer all my questions and deliver on its promise? Will it turn my opinion around to preach its brilliance? Did you even read the title? No. Well, mostly no. The thing you have to keep in mind, especially for this book, is it's a mixture of I love some parts, but hate others, and overall, it doesn't outweigh the reasons the book fails. Like everything with this franchise, it's complicated. <laughs> Summary time! It's been six months since the Twisted Ones, and John, Charlie's kinda sorta never gonna happen not boyfriend, she's not interested in you, dude, has isolated himself from the world. He only spoke when necessary, avoided eye contact, he made conversation, but he was getting better at speaking while walking away. Sometimes, he felt like he was fading away, and it was jarring and disappointing to be reminded that he could still be seen. I mean, who wouldn't be after seeing your childhood friend, NOT GIRLFRIEND, get killed by an animatronic only to mysteriously reappear like nothing ever happened and treats it like it's fine? It's fine, John. Everything is fine. Charlie's fine. It's fine, John. She looked like some stunning cousin of Charlie's. Maybe, but not her. Not the round-faced, frizzy-haired, awkward girl he had known almost all his life. Her face was uncannily different, though he could not have explained how. How can anyone think that's her, he thought. How can anyone think that's my Charlie? Put a pin on that last line. But yeah. John doesn't think it's fine. Don't you understand what you're doing to her after what she went through? It's insane, John. I don't know what that night did to you, but I know what it did to Charlie. And you know what? I don't think anything hurt as badly as having you refuse to speak to her, to say she's dead. I saw her die. Well, guess who's coming back to town after being gone for six months? I am Charlie, she said to her reflection. I don't have to convince John that I'm me. The words sounded thin in the small room. Who else would I be? A robot. Oh, um, spoilers. Look, we all knew this was going to happen, so I find it hard not to just cut right to the chase because we don't have time to be mysterious. Charlie is the Terminator. Because as John is figuring that out, we learn a new pizzeria has opened in town. Circus Baby's Pizza World. And a child was abducted this morning. What? A little girl. She disappeared sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. It's the second one this month, Clay added quietly. I wonder if there's a connection. 
But now, things get crazy, cause John hears a cryptic message coming from Charlie's severed rabbit head. Sure, just go with it. Leading John to find the real Charlie in a box, and now they need to figure out what is even going on as Robo Charlie tries to kill them. Terminator style, baby. Also, Circus Baby's Pizza might be a part of it somehow. I don't know, this summary is a mess, cause this book is hot! Garbage! But I also kind of like it. Look, the thing that made the original games click was how simply complex they were. You thought you were just surviving murder robots, but you were actually discovering a story about murder, revenge, and finding peace using the era of Stranger Danger as its backdrop, like IT Chapter 1. Complex, because the information was all over the place, but told in a simple way that felt satisfying to piece together while open enough to interpret it your way. It's amazing. Then... something happened. As the games continued, their story started to get more and more complicated as Scott got more ambitious, but those ambitions got the better of him. I wish I had another property to help illustrate my point. Oh! Follow me. Halloween started out as a simple little movie about a madman killing babysitters, with the subtext being that even living in the suburbs, you are not safe, and that killers can come from anywhere. With the reason behind it being... What was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Okay... But what if we tried to explain that evil? Enter the sequels with the goal to explain Michael Myers. In Halloween 2, the first one, Laurie Strobe is revealed to be Michael's long lost sister and that's why he was hunting her down. This is stupid. Carpenter admits it himself. He only wrote it purely as a function of having decided to become involved in the sequel to the movie where I didn't think there was really much of a story left. But boy did this lead to some really... The third one has no connection, so it's the FNAF world of the franchise. But 4, 5, and 6 takes Michael Kills His Family to... Oh, new lows. Where instead of Lori Strobe, cause she's dead, for the first time, focuses on her daughter, Jamie Lloyd. These films are bonkers. Along with family killing, it hints that Jamie might become the next Michael, and they share a psychic connection, and there's a weird symbol, and a guy in a black coat, and all of this divulges to reveal Michael was cursed by a cult to do old Halloween cult stuff by his babysitter, and that's why he's a killer. Boy, all this backstory and explanation enhances the horror of the original. It's scarier now. Yeah, no one liked this, which is why they dumped all that except Lori is Michael's sister and tried to end the series on a good note, but was too successful again, so Lori Strobe dies. Again. Funny enough, Resurrection is the first time they try to make Michael a thoughtless killer again. Michael Myers is a killer shark. Baggy ass overalls. He gets his kicks off of killing everything and everyone that he comes across. Eh, Donald Sutherland did it better. But don't worry, Buster Rhymes, you still hold the title for best worst thing in the series. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, no one liked it, so remake time! Where it's cause of bullying and dysfunctional parents. It's scarier now! Oh, the horror! Now we have another sequel, remake, reboot, cause of all things to have a multiverse, it's Halloween. So, what does this Cliff Notes of Halloween have to do with FNAF and the books? Cause it suffered the same fate as any popular horror franchise, where each new entry trying to explain the simple horrors undermines what made it scary. When Scott announced the book series, I was curious what route he would do. Would they be straight up novelizations? Maybe a bridge to sister location? Or just a new story altogether? Maybe in universe, maybe not, but something that stands on its own. But the 
books do a little of everything. Each book is more or less a novelized version of the games, Silver Eyes especially, while bridging FNAF and Circus Baby, and is a new story cause Scott found his own story too complicated to fit within the games. But the real reason these books exist is to explain story concepts Scott couldn't tell in game, taking simple horrors and explaining them to meaninglessness. The mysterious purple guy? Turns out he's the co-owner of the restaurant. Also a mad scientist. The creepy nightmare animatronics? Mind control hallucination disc made by the child's father, who is also the purple guy. He's a mad scientist. And the fourth closet explains that robot children are a thing, and a mad scientist experimenting on children's souls, calling it Revenant. Don't even get me started. The books are just giant citation guides for theory fodder with a story you can throw away. Why do a story then? If these were like the survival logbook, I wouldn't have a problem, nor make these videos. But we have three non-canon books that are poorly thought out. Wonder why my summary got messy at the end? That's cause the book divides into two different plot lines that are connected in the barest of ways. Look. I could spend hours dissecting this book, but we don't have the time. Here are the most notable things to talk about. Aunt Jen is a waste of a character. She's barely featured in the other books until Fourth Closet, only to die before she can explain her importance to the plot, that importance being she was collecting documents the characters would read later. Honestly, with how many people become robots, I'm surprised Scott couldn't just make one more. Jessica climbing into the trunk of Robo Charlie's car without telling her friends only to get captured makes no sense. She just randomly thinks it and no one knows about it till way later. It would have made sense if Carlton did it. Speaking of which, one of the two plot lines the book delves into is William Afton experimenting at Circus Baby. It's no surprise, William Afton is harder to kill than Naraku. Oh god, I'm old. But here's the thing, he doesn't add anything to this story. Its purpose is to show him slowly fusing his body to an amalgamation of the old FNAF robots to somehow live forever using soul energy called Revenant. I will never understand why Scott thought this was a good idea. Afton kills kids. Kids possess robots. Robots get revenge. Revenant is FNAF's Metachlorians. Plus, for being the main villain, he actually never talks to Charlie or John once here. Let me repeat that. William Afton, the antagonist of everything, does not have a final confrontation with our protagonist. You know who does? Carlton. Remember him? I mentioned him a few paragraphs ago. It would have made sense if Carlton did it. Speaking of which... Yeah, I don't blame you. Talk about a waste. Overall, it makes sense since his childhood friend was killed by Afton, but Scott barely uses him. After Silver Eyes, he's basically gone in the Twisted Ones, and for the first half of the fourth closet, is barely a supporting character to fill up space. It makes no sense. Outside of Charlie, Carlton is the only other character with an arc to explore who has the motivation to do stupid things like go into Robo Charlie's car cause he learns she nearly killed his father. Aunt Jen was a waste cause she added next to nothing to the story. Carlton's a waste cause his story is never fully realized. Instead it's given to Jessica whose character is... there? Also Scott needed a female roommate for Charlie. Afton and Robo Charlie working together makes no sense. The book says they are. Henry found a unique spark, created something truly different, something he didn't deserve or intended to stumble upon. He gave the woman a sharp look. You will bring it to me. Am I not enough? She asked softly. No, you're not, he said firmly, looking away. Ugh. This paragraph make me brain hurt. First, Robo Charlie is Baby, who is Afton's daughter in the games. If the books were canonical, their exchange would make sense. But they're not here, so how do they meet each other? Why are they working together? 
Baby can kill anyone no problem, so why work for someone who's not her father since she wants to kill Charlie herself? Also, why would he want Charlie? It doesn't... Okay, now I need to explain the second plot line. There, John and Charlie learn the dark truth about her father and in the end, what Charlie is. This is the plot line that brings the series full circle and reveals what it's been all about. After all, how can someone like Baby, aka Robo Charlie, actually fool people to think she's human in the mid 90s? Robots like what you're talking about don't exist. At least, not yet. Well, that's cause Robo Charlie, aka Baby, is Charlie, while Charlie is Robo Charlie. She was a robot the whole time! Da, da, da! See, Henry was obsessed working on Baby while ignoring Charlie. So Charlie went to play with Baby alone and she killed her, finding her soul to become Robo Charlie, aka Baby, who wants to be called Elizabeth. I have these memories. I know they don't belong to me, and yet at the same time, they do. She paused. I know they don't belong to me because I don't feel anything when they come to mind. They are just there. To cope with his incompetence, he decided to make four robot Charlies from baby to adult using Afton's mind control disc to fool himself into thinking she's real. But he only got to the third one, our Charlie, till the guilt and the disc made him mad so he kills himself, leaving the final robot, which was Elizabeth, aka Baby, aka Robo Charlie, mother of Springlocks, fourth in her name, blah blah blah, left in the closet to rot. Oh, I get it! That's why she wants to kill Charlie, cause daddy didn't love me. I'm still not enough, Elizabeth whispered. Even after this, embodying the one thing father did love, I'm not enough. Also, it turns out Elizabeth was the silver eyes from the first book, which... Thank you for answering that question. So why does Afton want Charlie again? There's nothing special about her. She doesn't have Revenant like Elizabeth. Why isn't he experimenting on her? The only answer I can think of would be this old dying man wants to inject his Revenant into the barely college age robot girl and I hate the things I just said. It's not like any of this matters. They never meet cause Elizabeth goes against orders and wants to kill her. These plot lines don't mix. The only reason Afton is here is cause he's the bad guy but his relevance to the plot has no impact. Elizabeth is the villain here, and to be honest, Henry is the true villain of this story. Boy, this franchise has some serious daddy issues. Wait, I just realized something while writing this. Didn't Afton say he killed Charlie? Yeah, right there. But who... I, I, was he lying the whole time? We don't know. He never confirms, but it's what the first two books mention. But this contradicts everything. But it's not lying, because in the games, that would be true, but the books are not canon. Why did Henry build a robot that kills? Scott, you are full of it. I don't like to say that, cause of all the books, this one has some of the best tension in any of them. The scene with Clay alone in his house feeling, not hearing, something is outside his door is downright spine tingling. The cat and mouse everyone plays with Elizabeth is a game of mental poker on a tightrope till John gives it up too soon. But it was fun when it lasted. While Jessica is nothing to write home about, I can't deny her getting chased by Mangle in those kid tunnel areas is fun, but does overstay its welcome. And while I don't like a lot of the concepts, I do find the theme of fatherhood from both the games and books to be something of interest. Scott is also a father, so I wonder if this series was for him to explore some of his worst fears. When you are a child, your parents are everything. They are your world, and you don't know anything else. When you are a little girl, your father is your world. But those are only small glimmers of a decent story. They can't override the mess this book is, even with its attempt at an ambiguous ending. 
Oh god. One of the other things I like about the book is the sense of tragedy at the end. Charlie realizes everything she is is based on a lie of a terrible father, which makes her sacrifice to kill her and Elizabeth all the more heartbreaking. If the book went through with it, I might have actually liked it to a degree. But that's not what happens. So, William dies the same way in the games, and everyone seems happy. The dead kids are at peace, no one else dies, but John is depressed. <laughs> he goes to the tombstone we originally thought was Charlie's brother, but actually her that they never read. He's about to go to it when, off in the distance, he sees a shadowy figure and goes to it. They disappear as we get to read what was on the tombstone, Charlotte Emily, which means her dad's name is Henry Emily. What was her mom, Elizabeth Emily? Scott, what the hell is this? Was this your attempt at one more mystery that's not a mystery? Come on, we all know that's supposed to be Charlie alive somehow, I guess John fixed her up or something. And the ambiguity? It's about whether or not John can accept the reality or fiction of Charlie and like Henry, chooses fiction. With the odds of him suffering the same fate, but I guess that doesn't matter cause John finally got his Charlie after all. Oh yeah, remember that pin? Let's pull that back out. Instead of letting the book have its tragic end, you decide to give John, the guy Charlie showed barely any romantic interest in, to finally get the robot girlfriend to call his own, and expect us to be fine with it? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine. This is not fine, Scott. Ew. Look, Scott, if you made it this far, there's a lot I admire about you. The fact FNAF was your final stab at being a game developer, taking your criticisms and using it as your strength is aspiring for a lot of people, and you should be proud of that. I know there's a good story peeking through here. Heck, I think there was a way to make them canon even. I thought of a possible way to do that, but doing so would add like another 10 minutes to this video to properly explain, so I'll probably make it its own thing. Books are a wonderful medium that you weren't able to use to its full potential. Why should anyone care about them when all they need is your lore bits? FNAF is still a fascinating property one cannot dismiss, but without taking the time to step back from whether the games are good or whose timeline is correct, we can look at the story and actually discuss what makes it good, bad, or just insane. To make a long video short, Scott, thank you for the games with a story no one expected. But your books are wasted potential. But hey, those are my thoughts. But what are yours? Hello? Is anyone there? Hello? No! Oh my god! He has a pizza cutter!